In my vlog on Shropshire folklore of Mary Webb, I mentioned that it, Mary was heavily influenced by Charlotte Byrne. And a jointly authored book, Shropshire Folklore, A Sheaf of Gleanings. I actually find that A Sheaf of Gleanings is ready available, both from booksellers and online. So I've decided to begin a series based of, um, uh, from the large and detailed book. Uh, where I can, I'll augment it with additional materials. I think I also need to apologise that it'll mostly use still photography that I can find on the internet. As from Indonesia, I often cannot find, well, I cannot find relevant video clips and I'm most unlikely to return to the UK again. Charlotte Sophie Byrne, or Lottie, 1850 to 1823. Charlotte was actually born just over the border in Staffordshire at Morton Vicarage. Um, it's said that she inherited her interest in folklore from her mother, also called Charlotte Byrne, but this time Charlotte Anna Byrne, 1820 to 1893. Uh, Charlotte's father, Sambrook Thomas Higgins Byrne, 1822 to 1861, was born into a wealthy Staffordshire family. Uh, he matriculated at St. Trinity, uh, sorry, at Trinity College, Oxford, in 1841, but did not take a degree. Uh, but it would seem that he was disinherited by his father. He was assisted by his brother, the Reverend Thomas Byrne, um, whom was the perpetual curate of Morton in Staffordshire. However, the family to move to Summerhill, Edgemond in Shropshire in 1854, having exhausted their welcome at the Morton Vicarage. And Lottie seems to make a big point of this, that she's um, finally living in Shropshire. But the truth is, <coughs> all of these spaces I speak of are just running along the border of Shropshire and Staffordshire. They're very similar places, to be honest. Now, her father's said to have taken to shoot in hunting and drinking. In 1857, he was twice, twice thrown from his horse. And as events surrounding it were somewhat taboo, it's fair to assume that he was drunk. But this led to his premature death in 1861. Uh, Lottie suffered a serious illness during her early years. Uh, conditions of ill health and obesity would impede her physical well-being throughout her life. In 1875, Byrne became friendly with Georgina Frederick Jackson, who was collecting material for a, Shof a Shropshire workbook, 1780, uh, sorry, 1879, and its companion book, work with the provisional title of Folklore Gleanings. And Jackson's demise led Byrne to take over her material, adding her own collection of tales to produce Shropshire folklore, a sheaf of gleanings. Uh, this probably explains the claim that the book was jointly authored. In the 19, uh, 1890s, she resided at Pyberch, Eccleshall, again in Staffordshire, uh, where she collaborated with the local folk folklorist and folk song collector, Miss Alice Annie Keary of Stoke-on-Trent. Together they spent three years, around 1890 to 93, uh, collecting material locally in North Staffordshire. Uh, while a number of joint papers were published, Byrne moved to Cheltenham somewhere around 1894 and the project failed to real be realised in a book form. She became the first female president of the Folklore Society. 1909 to 1911 and, and indeed was active in the Folklore Society for some 40 years. In the South Isle of Barrington Church, a cross-legged effigy representing some unknown knight of the late 14th or early 15th century it's a wooden figure rather than stone and exhibits the unusual costume of a surcoat worn over plate arbour. Uh, to local, lo the local people call him Outscriven of Brompton, 
The story goes that Scriven was going from Brompton to visit his lady love at Eton Mascot, two hamlets in the Barrington Parish. Uh, just by the stile at the bottom of Banksy Peace, he met a great lion. Out Scriven had brought his sword with him and he attacked the lion. In the end, the man overcame the beast and cut him in two. One can see the figure of the lion cutting half just the same, a lying under the feet of the image, and on the man's face you may see the lion gave out Scriven a terrible scratch and tore away half his cheek. On the outside of the east end of the south aisle is a headstone to Scriven of Brompton, 1786. A locals may have connected the two and so given rise to the legend. Uh, there is also a view that Old Scriven was a member of the Lee family of Langley near Acton Burnell, who were patrons of the church. And I actually grew up close to Barrington, but I have to admit I never came across it as a story. Or at least I've forgotten it. On the southern side of Gen Wenlock Edge, it rises gently in a smooth grassy slope. But northwards it breaks off suddenly in sheer perpendicular escarpment, only passable in a few places by a steep path and forming a natural boundary which cuts off the wide valley of Apedale to the north from the no less lonely and beautiful Corvedale to the south. As Houseman said, on Wenlock Edge, the woods in trouble, his forest fleece the reeking heaves, its gales, its piles, its saplings double, and thick seven snow on the leaves. Tradition tells of a major smallman of Wilderhope, in the time of the Civil War, leaped his horse over the precipice, at a spot where it sits its steepest, rather than surrender, to a party of roundheads whom, by whom he was being hotly pursued. Um, the horse was killed, but he marvellously escaped on her, but the major marvellously escaped unhurt. It's said that he alighted on a crab tree still to be seen growing out of the rock, clambered down and made his way safely um, along the foot of the edge to his old mansion in Wilderhope, although some say that he made his way on foot to deliver his dispatches to the royalist garrison in Shrewsbury. The scene of his adventure is still called the Major's Leap. Now, I seem to recall my father recounting this tale to me, but I cannot be sure. Certainly the road to Shrewsbury has a very steep hill known as Harley Bank, which descends the edge. Uh, this results in many cars crashing into the embankment and local homes, including Jane, a former girlfriend of mine from Northamptonshire, who was unused to such a road. Uh, between Priesthope and uh, Letwick Hall, there is a story of a more mythical hero, Ipkin, Remembered in a rock jutting out of the edge just above, Ipkin was a famous robber knight who inhabited the cave at the base of the crag, concealed amongst the trees in the bushwood. Uh, just above Blakeway Farm between Hewley and Harley, he and his followers lived unharmed for many years and gathered great quantities of stolen treasure. At last a mass of the overhanging rock fell, blocking the mouth of the cave, imprisoning the robber band forever. Uh, but Itkin's rock is still said to be haunted. The mark of the knight's gold chain may be traced on it, and if anyone shall be so hardy as to stand up on the cliff and cry, Itkin, Itkin, keep away your long chin. Should that be chain? I wonder. Um, the ghost of the imprisoned robber will appear with the gold chain still about his neck, and with one blow sweep the insulting speaker over the precipice to be dashed to pieces by the fall. Uh, there are also rumours of Rome moving lights seen above the cave by night, showing that the robbers are still on watch, guarding their hidden treasure. On the steepest side of Neftcliffe Hill, overlooking the road from Oswestry to Shrewsbury, 
is a large cave in the face of a rock approached by a flight of steps and divided into two rooms by a pillar or half wall of rock on which is cut the inscription HK 1564. It's known as Kiniston's Cave, the dwelling of wild Humphrey Kiniston, supposedly a high-born outlaw of Henry VII's time. He's believed to have been a very clever man called Kiniston who robbed to the rich and gave to the poor and sold himself to the devil. He had a wonderful horse which was always shod backwards so no one might be able to track him and which was, according to some, the devil himself in the shape of a horse. And mounted on his steed, Kiniston one day was pursued and leaped from the top of Nestliff Hill to, distant, uh, to Ellesmere a distance of some nine miles. Others say that the leap from Nestliff to Loughton Park, five miles away, and from thence to the top of Bryden Hill. Uh, but I, but others say that, that the devil helped him to do it, and they show no place where he leaped from. Uh, and they show the place where he leaped from on the top of the hill. And there are bones of the horse kept in the cave now. Uh, there are supposedly hoof marks, may still be seen but there's little agreement actually where uh, maybe on a stone on the bank of the Severn at a place known as Kiniston's Leap where the river is 40 feet wide and according to some the freebooters and the horse leapt over it another story is of Sir Roger Kiniston of Hordley and was made uh, castle keeper of Middle Castle and knocking and after the decease of his son Humphrey Kiniston was tenant of the castle. He had two wives, but he could not lay claim to the coat of arms. He apparently got into a lot of debt and was outlawed. Uh, he left Middle Castle and sheltered himself in a cave near Nescliffe. Uh, when he got over Montford's Bridge, which uh, and was on the, that side of the Severn, which is next to Shrewsbury, he needed to return over the bridge. Under the sheriff, the, the under sheriff came with a considerable company of men to the bridge. They took several plank blanks, making the the breadth such that no horse would be able to leap over it, and they laid themselves in ambush. When Wild Humphrey returned and was about to cross the bridge, they rose up to apprehend him. Humphrey leaped clearly over the breadth. It's said that he rode into the courtyard of Aston Hall, a neighbouring mansion belonging to the Lloyd family, and coolly demanded refreshment. Ale was brought to him, which he drunk without dismounting. Meantime, the gates were closed and preparations made to seize the audacious robber, as it, as it were a trap. But he quietly finished his draft, put the silver tankers in his pocket, and spurring his horse, leaped over the serving men, gates and so made off unharmed. The horse grazed at will in the neighbour's fields, returning always from any distance of his master's whistle. At night he was stabled in the outer division of the roomy cave. Every Sunday Humphrey's mother used to come over from Brighton to bring him dinner, but only when she could without endangering his safety. Humphrey is said to have been very good to the poor and not could bear no injustice. If he met two carts on a road, one with three horses and one with one, he would take the leader from the first and fasten it in front of the single horse, so as to make them both equal. The poor people loved him and were grateful for his bounty. In return for his benefits, they used to go and cook meals for him and take povender for his horse. And it is no doubt partly owing to their friendship, as well as the talents of himself and his horse, that he escaped every attempt that was made to capture him. And he at last died peacefully in his cave. Of course, this leads to the theory that Humphrey was the origin of the Robin Hood story. Humphrey Kiniston, son of Sir Roger and Elizabeth Grey, was outlawed in 1491, the year when Perpin Perkin Welbeck first came forward as a pretender to the throne. Uh, the little Duke of York, whom Welbeck impersonated, was actually born in Shrewsbury, and that his claims to the crown would probably seem especially strong in the eyes of Salopian Yorkists. Two years later, Humphrey Kiniston received his pardon, but it was not proved whether 
the debt or politics had led to his outlawry. It's certain that though he did have some money difficulties, for he and his mother appeared in the corporation books of Shrewsbury, as given a joint bond for the sum of twenty pounds borrowed to them. He is said to this is said to be he is said to have died on the day. He, he, his will is said to bear the date of 1534, and this would mean that date in the cave of 1564 is inaccurate. Uh, but Nesliff appears to have been the haunt of outlaws and highwaymen from time immemorial. You see, it overlooks the road from Shrewsbury to Oswestry, which Shrewsbury dra- drapers would pass along to attend the Welsh flannel market at Oswestry. Uh, the journey was a dangerous one, and in 1583 the Draper's Company ordered that no Draper should set out of Oswestry Street on Monday before six o'clock, and they should wear their weapons all the way and go in company. Near Nestcliff is a farmhouse, formerly the Wolf's Head Inn, which a hundred years ago was a rendezvous for thieves and highwaymen. It probably took its name from the crest of some neighbouring family. Now, I did mention Wild Kiniston in my vlog on Wild Agdrick, having as a child confused the two. Uh, Byrne devotes many pages to Wild Edric, but as I've already issued a vlog on him, I will not repeat these here. Uh, Nestliff is also the site of an army camp, where I endured freezing nights on exercises with the school's cadet force. Some 300 years before Wild Kiddiston was out, the, another outlaw lived in the very same part of Shropshire, called Falk Fitzwarren, the son of one of the, uh, the the son and one of the grandsons of another Falk Fitzwarren of Whittington Castle. In the time of King John, he was supposedly ejected from his inheritance at Whittington, becoming a freebooter, robbing the king's merchants, among other things, in the forest of Bryden. At length he laid wait for the supplanter at Whittington, Morris Fitzroger de Powys, at the foot of Nestliff Hill as he went towards Shrewsbury Castle, and he slew him. Falk decided to, to, Falk decided to join Llewellyn of Wales, uh, who was happy to accept a disaffected marchman. marchman. Uh, but King John and his uh, his men came into force against Cluellin, and thought and th- and through, th- and though for a short time, Falk was restored at Whittington, uh, the prince presently made peace with the King of England, and Falk judged it expedient to go overseas. On his return to England, and fell upon the king as he was hunting in the New Forest carried him captive on board ship and forced him to restore his lands and reverse the outlawry. So Falk returned to Whittington in peace. He was buried at last in New Abbey in Alderbury by, by the Seven Side, uh, which he, had, he himself had founded. In the old field near Ludlow are some tumuli one of which is called Robin Hood's Butts. On this Robin Hood stood and shot an arrow from his mighty bow at the weathercock in Ludlow Church steeple, but the arrow fell short and stuck in the roof of the northern chancel aisle, where it remains today. Uh, the arrow was a great one set on the ridge of the roof to mark that which was the Fletcher's Channel, the meeting place of the Chantry and Chapel in, of Ludlow Arrow Makers. It's been, sa- it's, it's, it's been said that Robin Hood was one of the darlings of the commons, while King Arthur was more associated uh, with the nobles. Roman coins supposedly found in Fletcher's Channel. Uh, locals call it Berry from Bear, and was very famous in King Arthur's time. King Arthur, King Arthur kept his court in Berry Walls, as a camp is now called, Bury Walls is an old Iron Age hill fort about 1.6 kilometres southeast of Western under Redcastle in Hawkstone Park. 
He said to have fought giants who lived at the Red Castle in Hawkston Park. Where the giant's well is yet to be seen amongst the ruins. Sir Thomas Mallory's History of King Arthur talks of the giants of Redcastle, Tarquin and Tarquinus, whom Lancelot slew, and then, in the words of the well-known ballad, which they tell the story to fight, an entrenchment uh, in a field near Western Church called, is called the Killyards, but known as Mountsfield, and it's believed to be the spot where Lancelot slew Carada, uh, Sir Caradas, the giant brother of Tarquin, who was riding homewards carrying Sir Gawain, uh, bound hand and foot and thrown across his horse behind him. A cliff in Hawkston Park is called Bury Walls. Some speculate it is the scene of King Arthur's court. The Red Castle is supposed to be in home of the Giants was built in 1232 by Henry de Audley, the founder of the famous family of that name. The Giants' Well is one of the towers which is still standing. It's ten feet deep in diameter and cut through the solid rock to the depth of at least 105 feet. Uh, these four features are incorporated into the Hawkston Park Follies, which were created by Richard Hill, 15. 50, uh, 1655 to 1727, also known as the Great Hill, and I think they were actually constructed around 1707. Uh, they're now a popular tourist attraction, but before they were a tourist attraction, I, I often used to go there just to meditate. In 1774, Dr. Johnson visited and wrote... Its prospects, its awfulness of shades, its horror of its precipices, the verdure of its hollows, the loftiness of its rocks. Above is inaccessible altitude, below is horrible profundity. Uh, by the side of Hawkston Park was Marchamley Monastery, where I recall seeing Jackie Wilson perform on the other side of a boating lake. And not only do few people believe me when I recount this story, I can find few references to there actually having been a monastery there, although there are some, but certainly no photos of it. I therefore end this vlog with a photo of Preston Hall in nearby Preston Brockhurst, which I would pass every Friday on my moped en route to see my soul Sam at the Raven. I also vowed that I, I would become rich and buy Preston Hall, uh, well, I never became that rich, and now I'm not rich at all. Nor am I ever likely to return to Preston Brockhurst, let alone to buy its hall.